in my heart <laughs> that I might not sin against you. All right, Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. I'm reading out New King James. It says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the, the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, before we get into the fullness of this lesson, we got to go backwards. Because we're explaining something that some, some of us weren't here to even know about. So Jesus is explaining something. And if you don't know what Jesus is explaining, it's kind of like butting in a conversation you don't know nothing about. And I don't want Jesus to tell y'all to mind y'all business. So let's go back and see what Jesus was saying previously, shall we? Matthew, same chapters, same chapter, verses 24 through 30. When you get that, say amen. 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 So it says, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to then go and gather them up? Y'all see that? Yes, sir. You see, what they, see what's going on with them? See what they're saying? There? But notice what Jesus said. But he said, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So everything we've been discussing, y'all, Jesus has been, he's introduced us or reintroduced us to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of heaven. We've been talking about the kingdom. Now, I wrote, I wrote this right here because it, it dawned on me. I've been teaching about the kingdom for so long, but some of us don't even know what the kingdom is. Because I used to teach it down in Yale Chapel. Yale Chapel. So when I was teaching it there, I was breaking it down and God was blessing us to get a, a a better, a more strong, more clear understanding. I see your hand, Ray. I'll come to you. So the Greek word for kingdom is basileia. Basileia. It means royalty. Basileia. Hey, how you doing? It means royalty. That royalty means that you come, you are, you are king, queen, or you come from that bloodline or lineage. Royalty. Kings, queens, princes, princesses. You, you have the status of, of one of those. You have the status of a king. You have the status of a queen. So when Jesus Christ is talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it's literally the king's dominion merged together. That's kingdom. Kingdom is two words merged together. King, dominion, merged together. So we're talking about the king's dominion. The rule, the realm, and the reign. Basileia. So y'all see right here, y'all read my, I came here early to Randy, I worked hard. I erased this like 30 times. <laughs> it's good. I can read it. All right. My daughter says she can read it. I see your hand, Ray. I don't forget. The kingdom is the rule of God, the realm of God, the reign of God. The rule of God, the words of God. Now, y'all know that in order for you to live in this world, you have to abide by rules. Rules keep everything in a proper place. You know, when y'all drive, some of y'all like to drive outside the lines. But you shouldn't be driving outside the lines, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. Some of y'all need to drive inside the line. When we play basketball, there's a boundary line called out of bounds. <laughs> if you step on the line, you're out of bounds. There are rules whereby if you, you have to conduct yourself in accordance to the rules. God's rule is his word. 
the realm of God, which means the world of God, the world of God, the, the heaven rules, the word of God says. Let's do this. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth, one world, as it is in heaven, another world. The two different worlds. The kingdom is not of this world. So when you are a kingdom disciple, a kingdom citizen, you are now operating from heaven's world. So the kingdom is God's word as well as God's world in God's reign, the ways of God. Not just the time in which he reigned or he ruled, but the manner in which he reigned or ruled. You, you know, you have some kings that were bad kings. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, the time of their reign was bad. Mm -hmm. The people suffered. The economy went down. I'm talking about a king. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about presidents. <laughs> I'm talking about kings. Y'all get your mind off the gun. <laughs> But this is the, the ways of God. We're talking about the reign, the manner in which he rules or reigns in your life. How long and how often do you allow him to reign in your life? So the kingdom of God is the rule of God, which is the words of God. We would call that the Bible. The realm of God, heaven, as well as the reign of God, God's ways, the way of holiness, righteousness. That's the kingdom. So I got two definitions that I think y'all can go by. Y'all can either go by my definition or y'all can go by Dr. Tony Evans' definition. Either one is going to be fine with me. Essentially, the kingdom of God is the rule, the realm, and the reign of the supreme divinity empowering every area of your life. Amen. The rule, the realm, and the reign of God Almighty empowering every area of your life. That's the kingdom of God. I like to say the rulers rule, rules to rule. The rulers rules to rule. The rulers rules to rule. That's a little bit. No, no. Dr. Tony Evans says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is God's comprehensive rule over every area of life as demonstrated through the individual, family, church, and society. I'm going to say that again. Dr. Tony Evans says that the kingdom of God, his definition of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is God's comprehensive rule over every area of life as demonstrated through the individual, family, church, and society. So any one of these definitions y'all desire to go by is fine with me. Y'all have to choose the definition that God gave me. That's fine. I cry later. I get over it. But that's a good definition. I think it's a good definition. Now, how many of us want to have God ruling our lives? I'll show hands. In order for God to rule your life, that means you have to allow him to be king. He cannot be prince. He cannot just be brother. He cannot be homeboy. He has to be king. That's why we have to have Jesus Christ as our Lord. Owner, ruler, master. He has to be the Lord, the leader, the owner, the ruler, the dominus of your life. And once he has that complete control, then he's able to execute and empower you to do everything that he's called and created you to do. So Jesus has been teaching us about the kingdom. And I'm sorry, I have to talk too fast. Questions, comments, observations. Ray Aya, yes, ma'am. Um, I just recognized something. What you recognize? <laughs> Oh my God. Five years old, recognize. <laughs> Lord, I think. That's the mama and you coming out. What, what you recognize, baby? Like, if you put a king, I think a queen is the king's wife, and they have, and the princess is, is the king and the queen's children. Girl, you better, you better teach. <laughs> you better teach. You, I'm glad you recognize that. That's true. <laughs> that is 100% true. God bless you, Ray. Okay. Uh, somebody who has a King James or a New King James version, would someone please read uh, verses 24 through 25 for me in uh, Matthew 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, But while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, 
and went his way. All right. So we're going to be talking through this portion, which is going to do a, a bit of a backdrop. Now, for those who were here, remember we discussed in regards to the wheat and the tares, or the, the wheat and the weeds. As the market says, they the tares or the weeds were poisonous. They were called darnel. They look just alike when they were when they're in the infant stage, but when they grow up, they started to become black. We talked about some of the, 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 the benefits of wheat, and we talked about some of the, the, the side effects of weeds. The benefits of wheat is that it was wholesome. You would become better when you took it, when you ingested it. But you take in a tear, you take in some weeds, and you become delusional. And we didn't want to be the type of the type of wheat that had weedish ways. That we would tearish in our ways, tearish in our thinking. I see your hand right out. So as we're going to be talking about this and talking about these key terms, <clears throat> excuse me. As we're talking about these key terms, Jesus was speaking about letting the wheat and the weeds or the tares grow together. And we discussed how that was a minister, that was ministry. How you have somebody that's in Christ that's growing, also connected to somebody who's in the church but's not growing. And if you decide to pull that person out of the church who is not growing, you can and you can have a collateral effect and end up hurting somebody that's a young believer. Because they're intertwined. So Brother Kevin is late to church. I'm gonna use it for example, he don't mind. Brother Kevin is late to church. And I'm like, Kevin, you need to stop coming because you're late. You either gonna be on time or you're gonna be you're gonna stop coming. Well, that in turn can end up hurting Sister Kiara because she's growing and y'all are connected to each other in a way by, I'm seeing you grow and I want to grow too. But here I am pulling you out in the term and I'm pulling her with me. It's a ministry term. So Jesus is simply teaching us, y'all, that we should not be putting our hands on God's people. We should not be putting our mouths on God's people. We should be praying to God about God's people. Amen. Y'all pay attention to this? Mm -hmm. Girl, they give y'all some chairs now. They do stand up. They do sit down. You sit down Indian style. We must play Doug Doug Goose. Don't put your mouth on people. Pray for people. That's both the wheat and the weeds. When the, when the servants saw what was going on, they didn't immediately intercede. They talked to the, they talked to the sower. They talked to God. Now, I know, y'all, we all see things that can bother us and make us question things. But don't go putting your hands or your mouth on people. You talk to God about it. If you see people doing good by God, talk to God. Tell God bless them. Tell God to encourage them. Tell God to strengthen them. If you see people not doing right by God, tell God about it. Tell God to help them. Tell God to open up their eyes, to open up their understanding. That's important. Don't be the type of person that sees stuff and always put your hands and mouth on it. Amen. Shut up! Don't be quiet for being quiet. Like this. No, 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 just. So, verses 24 and 25, we have some key terms. We have some key terms. We have the sower, the good seed, the sower's field, the sower's enemy, the tares, which we also call the weeds, and wheat. Now, later on in verse 30, Jesus introduces us to two, no, two new key terms. He talks about the harvest, and he talks about the reapers. Y'all paying attention? So I'm going to ask y'all some questions in a second. Now, the good news is we won't finish everything tonight, but we're going to have a real good foundation for where we're going to be going. All right? So we got the sower, good seed, his field, which is the sower, his enemy, tares, wheat, harvest, reapers. That's what we were discussing previously. But now let's go to our lesson for today. Somebody who has a King James or New King James. Please read verse 36 for me. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now, three parables have been discussed before we get to the explanation of this parable. The reason why Jesus explained, he taught three in the three additional parables is because he was still dealing with the people. He continued to deal with the people, so he continued to tell them and teach them different parables. Uh, parables are, are, are natural stories with spiritual principles. So you tell a natural story just to give the, the, the spiritual implication of why it was important and why you need to 
How you feel on that? Just a seat right over here, man. Don't even worry about the backpack for the sun. God bless you, man. Good to see you. So, with that being said, I want y'all to pay attention to something. I want y'all to pay attention to something. In verse 36, it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. Y'all see that? Jesus sends the multitudes away, all those who are hearing the parables, but they're not disciples. He sends them away. He goes into the house. Now the house can be, I'm coming to you, Isaac. Now the house can be representative of the church house. The reason why the house can be representative of the church house is because what follows after. The disciples ask him a question. The disciple is now able to get special attention. The disciple is now able to get revelation slash explanations that those who are on the outside can't get. Why y'all ain't excited about this like I am? <laughs> That's why it's important that you come to church house. You come to the church house because there's certain revelation that God can give you here that you ain't going to get watching uh, Love and Hip Hop. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> there's certain revelation you ain't going to get watching the Super Bowl. I said it. There's certain explanations that when you come to Kingdom Movement Bible study, you come to Wednesday night Bible study, you come to Sunday school, and then you're able to raise your hand and get an explanation over the scriptures, and it strengthens your walk, and it strengthens your understanding, and it strengthens your growth in the Lord. Go ahead, Isaac, you had your hand up. Was this one where you were talking about how Jesus was speaking to the, the people in the streets, and he was speaking, talking to them in parables? But his disciples actually always speaking to them in parables, and then the parables already going to do something wrong. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. oh, I love it. Yes, ma'am. Bray, I had a hand up? Okay. Yes, sir. Y'all going to let these kids beat you? Um, what's, what's in solution? Say it again, baby. What's in solution? What's, answer, what's a solution? Mm -hmm. A solution is an answer, an answer to a problem. Uh, That's an excellent question. You have your mama in you. <laughs> I'm so glad. So verse 36 says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. Yes. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. So again, come to the house of God. Right. So you can get the explanation. Come to the house of God. Continue to come. So you can get the revelation. If you are a child of God, you should not abandon his house. Amen. There's nowhere in scripture where God has called us to be kingdom disciples and we're not in the house of God. So they come in and then they begin to ask these questions. Now, again, we're not going to finish all this tonight, but we're going to get a, we're gonna lay down a good foundation. Uh, Pastor, will you read verses 37 through 39 for me? Yes. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Verse 39 to? Mm -hmm. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. All right, uh, this, now, this is why I have this side. Now, I have one rule, y'all. Well, actually, I have two rules. First, first rule is, if y'all got something to say, raise your hand. First time. Second rule is you can't laugh at my handwriting because I'm sensitive. <laughs> so that's it. That's the only two rules I got. I see your handwriting. Right the sower is the son of man. Now the son of man is a messianic title that's given to Jesus Christ. And I'm about to explain that in a second because if I don't explain this, none of this is going to make sense. None of this is going to make sense. So we're going to talk about the sower, the son of man, which is Jesus. The good seed, which is the sons or the children of the kingdom. His field, which is the world. His enemy, which is the devil, Satan, or the wicked one. The tear slash weeds, which is the sons of the wicked one. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. But let's talk about, real quick, the son of man. Because most times when you hear people say that Jesus Christ is the son of God, we automatically think that that's talking about his divinity. And that's not. Actually, son of man talks about more about God's, Jesus Christ's divinity as God than son of God. I know it can be a bit confusing because we deal with the triune God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. How many of us know that? How many of us know what air is made out of? Not, not many of us, huh? Oxygen. Oxygen. You got one of them. Nitrogen. Hydrogen. Carbon dioxide. 
Yeah. Gases, carbon dioxide, oxygen. Mm -hmm. If you take away one of those, do you still have air? No. Mm -hmm. That's how it is with God. Chemistry. If you take away one, Chemistry. you've taken away all. Now, someone turn to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And somebody else turn to Revelation chapter uh, 14 and 15. You said Daniel 7 and 14? Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Girl, you are growing. Yes, Lord. Revelation 1. Revelation 14 and 15. I'm ready when you're ready. Okay. God bless you. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Uh -huh. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominant is everlasting, dominant that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen. So Daniel has this vision, Daniel has this dream about the Son of Man sitting on the cloud uh, next to the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. Now, if uh, the reason I'm, I'm taking my time with this, brother, is because I want to make sure you get it. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why that's important is because Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is not just King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is God in the flesh. Now, because he's God in the flesh, we have to know that the, 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 the issues that we deal with in this world, y'all, started with man. So because sin came through man, God had to redeem the, redeem the sin through man. He had to redeem mankind through a man. That's what Jesus comes in. So it says that Jesus is sitting on the cloud. And anytime you see someone sitting on the cloud, that person has power. Amen. Bible even says that the that the dust of God's feet is a cloud. That's Nahum 1 and 3. Can you imagine that? God's dust is clouds. We got dust underneath our feet. We hate bringing it into our house. But God's dust is a cloud. I mean, how dusty is it? You know? So he's sitting next to the Ancient of Days. I see your hand, Ray. Put your hand down there. He's sitting next to the Ancient of Days, who is God the Father. He's God the Father. He's teaching us about who Jesus is. But then, as she read, says that his kingdom will be a kingdom that lasts forever. To him will be glory, honor, dominion. He will be worthy of worship. Y'all paying attention to this? That's why you have to have Jesus Christ as the king. He has to have 100% rule over your life. He has to have 100% control over your life. He has to be able to have 100% access to who you are. And you can't hold back from it. Right. There's a there's a little place in New York that they won't let you come in unless you wear certain clothes. You say, well, they just being uppity. That's their rules. That's their rules. Our house ain't the best house, but we say take the sh take the shoes off when you come in. Guess what you got to do? Take them shoes off. That's right. Take, yeah, take them shoes off because it's not your house. Right. So the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, sits. Uh, he sits on the cloud. That means he's coming in the power of God. Every time you see the cloud in Scripture, in most cases you'll see God being the, arch the architect of that. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Don't, don't read that yet from the pastor. So verse 37 uh, says, And he asked and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. He who sows the good seed is is the son of man. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. That's where we come in. That's where we come in. If we are sons of the kingdom, that means once upon a time we used to be wheat. If you notice, if you notice there's only seven, and there were eight over here. The only thing changed, y'all, was the wheat. Because you're not supposed to just remain this small. That's what we were talking about a few weeks ago. The mustard seed. Remember, the truth of the seed is the tree. Never focus on where you are. Focus on where you're going. Focus on what God says you can become. That's the truth of who you are. And remember, trees last longer than the seeds. You got yours? You got yours, Coach? Okay, so make sure. Make sure you prepare. 
Trees last longer than the seeds. Mm -hmm. Seeds remain small for a limited time. Right. But when they grow up as trees, they can turn old to 30, 40, 60, 70 years old, and they, they still be big old trees. That's what God is teaching us about the kingdom. That the kingdom of God inside of you will grow out of you to the degree that your, your life will be totally different than what it once was. My life now, he knows me. She knows me. BC. Before Christ. <laughs> I'm totally different now than what I used to be. Serenity says she can't, she can't imagine how I used to be that way. I said it's a blessing that I'm saved. To be cuckoo. Yeah, I cry now. <laughs> I used to never cry. I say I'm sorry and I ain't did nothing wrong. I used to never apologize. I would whoop you because I thought you said something. Now I'm seeking for peace. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's the kingdom. Besides Rayaya, questions, comments, <laughs> observations. No? What you got, Rayaya? I miss all of it because you just keep talking. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. His field is the world. <laughs> the tales are the sons of the wicked one. The harvest is the end of the age. Uh, and the reapers <laughs> are the angels. It's amazing. She, said she forgot it. <laughs> I forgot it there because she was teaching. We as children of God, are sons and daughters, children of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. God equates the field, the world <laughs> to the field. But remember, an enemy sowed weeds in his field. Right. The devil sent false wheat, as we discussed. Darnell, people who look saved but ain't saved. People who actually formulate salvation but do not possess. They profess it, but don't possess it. The devil sold them in God's field. Again, y'all, we are wheat. Wow. We are wheat, which is why you don't want to settle for having weedish ways. Right. You don't want to settle for having right. terrorish ways. If God exposes something in you, then we say, Lord, help me in that area. Forgive me in that area. Strengthen me in this area because I want to be wheat. I want to be wholesome. I want to make other people's lives stronger and better as opposed to they, they ingest me and they become delirious. Right. They ingest me and, I, and they get a headache. Yeah. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Revelation chapter 14, verse 15. Read that for me, Pastor. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. All right. Help us out real quick, Pastor. This is Jesus. Now, this is talking about the end of the age. This is Jesus. He's sitting on the cloud. But well, keep reading for me, Pastor. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Read the next verse for me. Verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle mm -hmm. on the earth, uh -huh. and the earth was reaped. Now, Everything that we're talking about now, ultimately, that's what's going, that's what's going to happen. See, when Jesus is mentioned about this field, the, the devil, uh, the tares, sons of the wicked one, the harvest, the end of the age, and the reapers who are the angels, we're gonna, he's going to start talking about a topic that most of us are afraid to talk about, don't want to talk about. Uh, some Christians are ashamed to talk about, but it's a true reality that we have to deal with, and it's a place called hell. It's a place called hell. It's a place of eternal torment, of eternal fire. We're going to have to deal with that. One thing I want y'all to know that Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. He's actually more descriptive about that than he is about heaven. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Verses 40 through 43. Somebody read that for me. In Matthew chapter 13. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who committed lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now this is regarding both the church and the broader world. It's regarding the church and the broader world. Because remember, the world is God's field. The world is God's field. So when Jesus is actually teaching this, he's teaching us about the world, the entirety of the world, as well as the church. Because the Bible says judgment must first start here in the house of God. It first starts at the church. Which means we who call ourselves Christians are going to be held to a higher accountability than those outside of the world. Let's see if they remember. Rand, uh, Rayaya, Serenity, Isaac, Jeremiah, everything y'all do? Everything you do? Represents Christ. Every, everything you do represents Christ. I teach my kids that everything you do represents Christ. Um, so because I'm teaching my kids this, I might as well teach the class this. Everything you do represents Christ. Make him look good. Everything you do represents Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, everything you do from here on out, you're saying God approves of it. Right. Make you think about the stuff you watch. Hmm. Make you think about the stuff you listen to. Make you think about the thoughts that you be thinking. When you when you know that everything you do represents Christ, and then you got people in a community who gonna see you do that, that person say, "Man, that person said they're Christian, so if they do that. Jesus do that." Hmm. Hey. <laughs> so this is regarding the, both the church and the broader world, true and false Christians, good and evil people. Now, the Jews expected Jesus as the Messiah to immediately destroy the evildoers and, uh, what's the word, vindicate the righteous. But Jesus was talking about dying, which is why some were upset with him and didn't want to follow him as Messiah because they wanted war. Jesus is saying, I'm going to die when they want Jesus to kill. We as Christians, y'all, don't seek die. vengeance. We don't seek vengeance. We seek peace. Amen. The Bible teaches us to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Yes, sir. We don't seek to harm our enemies. Jesus teaches us to love them. Right. See, when you are a citizen or a child of the kingdom, his rule runs you. Right. You're not operating from your own world. You live in his realm, heaven. And because my ways are not my ways and my thoughts are not my thoughts, I belong to the living God. He has reigned over my life. Is this making sense? Because I'm looking at y'all face and y'all looking at me puzzled. <laughs> y'all good? I'm going to give out a quiz see who's going to get a hundred. <laughs> so Jesus claimed to be the son of man. <clears throat> he claimed to be God in flesh. His disciples are now getting a clearer understanding as to who he is and why he's saying what he says. But there's four things that Jesus exposes, that Jesus teaches us inside these, inside these few little passages. Four things. The first thing is Jesus teaches us that he is not the source of evil. Right. Y'all write this down. I may have to call on you. Not the the first thing Jesus teaches us that he is not the source of evil. So I need two people. Somebody read verses 27 through 28 and another person read verses 36 through 39. Same chapter in Matthew. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? 27 through 20. 27, 28. And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? All right, somebody read verse 36 through 39. This is how we connect the dots. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares mm -hmm. of the field. Mm -hmm. Verse 37, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. How far? The, third night. the field is the world, the wow. good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked. Verse 39, The enemy that sowed them is the devil, Stop. the harvest. The enemy, Jesus is not the source of evil. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus is teaching us. All the time when, 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 when tragedy happens, when, when, hard, when bad things happen, when evil things happen, the Why first God? thing people want to question is, Why God? <laughs> but Jesus is not the source of evil. Notice that the devil did that. 
And what he did is he he throws his rock and hides his hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And if we always go to God with, with anger, hand. disappointment, and anguish, we're going to miss the true culprit behind the evil in the world. God is not the source of evil. Right. And if you want to be upset with anybody, you got to be upset with Adam. Because that joker decided to eat of the fruit that God told him not to. Because when God said, let us create man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion, once God said that, he had to step back because he's bound to his word. Yep. yep. So you don't think God didn't want to intercede when Adam was... But because he had to allow man to make the choice. Man chose Satan over God. And now people get mad at God like it's his fault. But he's not the source of evil. The second thing he teaches us is that the, that the world belongs to him. Verse 25, uh, verse 24, somebody read that for me. Verse 38, somebody read that for me. Said 25. 24 and 38. I apologize. Okay. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold good seed in his field. Right. And verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the true and the The field is the world. The entire world is God, y'all. It belongs to God. First thing he teaches us that he's not the source of evil. And y'all know evil is to live backwards. So if you live in outside, you live in backwards, you live in outside of God, you live in evil. That's the first thing he teaches us. He's not the source of that. Second thing he teaches us that the entire world is his. It all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. We all belong to God. That's why we all will have to give an account to God. I see your hand right now. The third thing he teaches us that Satan had no right to bring evil into his world. Right. That's why the, that's why he did it in a sneaky manner. That's why Jesus says an enemy has done this. But notice when the enemy did it. If y'all were paying attention to what we were reading earlier, notice when the enemy did it. While man slept. He did it when, when the saints went to sleep. Right. When those who were supposed to know God were sleeping on him. Hmm. When those who were supposed to be woke. You know, everybody's woke. Woke. By four or five exclamation marks in the back of it, too. <laughs> woke. But they were asleep. And while they slept, the enemy sold tears. False wheat. Imposters. Mimickers, not many knees. He sold those things that could distort the kingdom of God. Somebody read verse 25 and then 38 through 39. But while men slept, his enemy came and sold Taz among the wheat and went his way. 28 through 39? 38 through 39. 38 through 39. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the Taz are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So once again, y'all, Satan had no right to do it. That's why he snuck it in. Yeah. Now here's the thing. Sin is sneaky. Yeah. Yes, it is. It first starts off subtle. Cancel. And then as sin grows, it becomes more bold. That's why the Bible says when sin is full grown, it bursts life. It, produ it produces life. It's baby, uh, death. It produces death. This baby is death. Sin's Sin is, is just this small until it gets life in it. And that's how you know it's producing death. You know, we're going to be honest in the house of blood. Ain't nobody going to lie to me in church, right? Hmm. You know, when your mama and your dad told you not to do something, you snuck and did it the first time. <laughs> you better. First time you did, you snuck. <laughs> you, <crash> your back. <laughs> you snuck. You, you made sure. Well, nobody around. You made sure. You snuck and did it. <laughs> That's how sin works. Sin is sneaky first. It's subtle first. That's why the scripture says that now the serpent was more cunning, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It started off subtle, sneaky, until it became bold, producing death. But it had no right to be. Now, that if I was Satan, that's exactly what I would do to make sure that the people don't reverence God the way they should. I would pervert truth I would compromise holiness. I would make sure that you thought that all you need was grace and you don't have to live holy so, so you can be okay. 
You should always hear the word of prosperity, but never receive a word of conviction so you can always be okay. Because that type of word, that compromising of the gospel, the doctrine of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, that compromised status of the word makes you a compromised Christian. Weak, feeble, ready for defeat and destruction. Because you're not on guard, you sleep. So. But that's why Jesus said, wake up! Yeah, I'm scared to wake up. I see, I see. Wake up, wake up. So that's the third thing he teaches us. Satan had no right to bring evil into his world. Number four, that Jesus Christ will assert his kingship over the entire world by punishing sinners and blessing saints at the end of the age, at the appointed time. That's what I would. Okay. That Jesus Christ will assert his kingship over the entire world, which is his, his field, by punishing sinners and blessing saints at the appointed time which is the end of the age. First thing was what? Who remembers that? Me. Um, That's what I'm talking about. He isn't the source of evil. Good. Number two. World, the world is his. Number three. Satan had no right to bring evil into his world, but he did it while men were asleep. Number four. Um. No. <laughs> <laughs> that Jesus Christ will assert his kingship over the entire world by punishing sinners and rewarding the saints. Now, those first three, God is not the source of evil. The second one is that, what's the second one, Bianca? Um, the world is in. Okay, make sure you got it. What's the third one? Um, Satan had no right to bring evil, but he did it while men were asleep. Now, notice, notice those first three. All of those compromise our relationship with God if we decide to have a relationship with evil. Mm. Because if God is good, the scripture declares that God is good. If God is good and he's not evil, you cannot have an association with evil because there's no evil in the kingdom. Right. That's why you have to be mindful of your heart. Yes, Lord. That's why you can't afford to have a heart of hatred, a heart of hardness, a heart of dullness, a heart of unforgiveness, a heart of envy, a heart of, of, of malice. You can't afford to have a hard heart because if you have those types of heart, you're only allowing evil to live. And God won't allow those things into his kingdom. So when Jesus Christ does come and assert his kingship, it's going to be some, it's gonna be some, uh, some reckoning. Well, number four. Number four. That Jesus Christ will assert his kingship. I want you to capitalize all them letters too. Jesus Christ will assert his kingship. Over the entire world. <laughs> by punishing sinners. And rewarding the saints. Good job, Samantha. Need you go teach this next time. I'm going to say it again. How much time I got? It's 748. So it's 750. Lord's the same. I'll be done. And the kids will come up here and they'll tell us what they got to eat. That Jesus Christ will assert his kingship over the entire world by punishing sinners and rewarding the saints at the appointed time, which is the end of the age. That's why we must be ready. Right. I pray y'all come back next week because that's when, as I said, this is just our foundation. That it's gonna get, it's gonna get better. I can't keep saying good because I don't want to teach you. It's gonna get better. But in lieu of Kobe Bryant's passing, how many of us expected that to happen? Nobody. But the scripture says, "No man knows the day nor the hour." Mm -hmm. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about this in regards to his salvation because that's between him and the Lord. His daughter and the Lord and those who are in that plane of the Lord. But I want y'all to know how unexpected death is. And when your number is called, when your day is up. That's, it. Better be ready. That's why we have to make sure that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, is our Lord and Savior. Because he cannot be your Savior if he is not your Lord. He cannot save you from your sin if he's not the Lord of your life. 
But there is a day of appointment. That day will come. We all will see that day. Will it be through the sky in the rapture or through the ground through death? We all have an appointment. Yes, sir. We have all have a death appointment. We all have an appointment on the day we're going to meet the, meet the Lord. And the scripture says it's appointed for man once to die, and after that, the judge. Scheduled time. A scheduled time. You don't know it, but God knows. Uh, what's the scripture, Pastor? Teach us to number our days. That we may know them and apply them unto wisdom. So it's seven fifty, and the kids are getting ready to come up. There may be somebody in here who's not right with the Lord. Your relationship with Jesus is not a relationship. It's, it's, it's distant. It's not close. You don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You know about him, but you don't know him for yourself. Let Kobe Bryant's demise, and I say that with the utmost respect, his departure from this world, he and his wife, or his, I mean his daughter and those on their claim, let that be a wake-up call because there's no amount of money that can save you. There's no amount of fame that can keep you. If Jesus Christ is not Lord and Lord and Savior, everything that you're doing in this world is nothing. So is there anybody who has the who has the, the boldness to say, I want to accept my, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Say, I'm not saved. I want to be saved today. That if my day is up, my number is called, I'll be ready. Is there one today? Come on, Cherry.